Good to see you. Uh, if you're new here, uh, my name is Joel. I'm one of the leaders here at Church of Christ the King. Um, good to be speaking to you and to be speaking to you at Shoreham and the race course and the villas in Hove, uh, which, launched, uh, which is launching right now. And uh, this is an exciting time for us as a church. We've started this series, Being Human. This is the second week. We're going through chapter 4 of Ephesians. Basically, it's a part of the Bible that talks about uh, the crunchy, practical parts of life when Jesus is in charge of your life. Uh, if Jesus has made you into a new person, which is what he came to do, uh, then these are the things that he will do in your life. This is the kind of difference that he will make. And this week we're talking about lying, the subject of truth and lying. So we're going to read from chapter 4, verse 25 of Ephesians, then I'll pray and then we'll get into it. It says this, Therefore, having put away falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you for the Bible. And we thank you for your son, the Lord Jesus Christ, about whom it speaks and to whom it all leads. And we pray that you would send your Holy Spirit now so that each one of us here today will learn Jesus, will understand Jesus, will come to know Jesus more clearly and have our hearts changed by that experience. We ask this according to your mercy and in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So lying, why is lying wrong? That's the first thing I want to look at. And then why do we lie? That's the second thing I want to look at. And then thirdly, how do we stop lying? How do we get free from this habit of lying? So why is lying wrong? I think we all agree that it's wrong. Interesting, actually, not every virtue in the Bible, not every kind of good thing that the Bible lifts up and says, this is good, this is the way to live, is as uncontroversial as lying. I think basically everybody agrees that deception, dishonesty, deceit, whatever you want to call it, is bad. There are very few people who think differently and I guess that one of the reasons we see it like that is because we feel the impact of it so quickly. So if I was to preach to you this week about chastity and why everybody should be restricting sexual intercourse to husband and wife relationships because that's what the Bible says, that would be controversial in a city like this or in a country or in a, in a season of history like this because everyone's got their own opinion. People don't tend to agree on that so easily. But we do agree, generally speaking, that lying's bad. No one likes a liar. I guess, like I say, it's because we feel the impact of it. We, we are aware quickly of its distorting effects on society, on families, on, on communities, on neighborhoods. It ruins things. The ancient story of the boy who cried wolf is actually a brilliant story because it's, it says everything you need to hear about the social effects of lying. Because of someone's dishonesty, he wasn't believed when his message was important. The, the commodity called trust lost its value. Currency went down. And when the real crisis came, trust was at such a low ebb that the village was uh, destroyed. That's, that's how lying works. It's evil. And we all sense that it's got that horrible effect. But here's the thing I want to say, and just to, to tease this out. We, we all can see that lying has bad effects. Lying ruins families. Lying ruins community. Lying ruins friendships. I bet all of you have personal experience to some level of what that is like. You feel the grief that comes because of lies. But, but what about when lying works? Because frankly, it does. It does. There was a psychologist in, uh, back in 1999, I think, a guy called uh, Feldman. He wrote a book. He was uh, based at the uh, University of uh, Boston in Massachusetts. He wrote a survey that he carefully, published a survey, carefully done, coming to the point of saying the children in, in primary schools, as we would call them, who are most popular, are usually the best liars. Uh, certainly at the ch childhood level, lying gets you somewhere. It makes you successful. It gets you ahead of the pack. And, th and then another uh, psychologist called Charles Ford, who wrote a book called Lies, Lies, Lies. This is all very contemporary. His basic finding was that 
Everybody lies. It's just that some people are bad at it. And the bad liars are the ones in prison. The good liars are the ones who run HMOs. Simple as that. It's not a question of all the baddies. Lying always, always end up in trouble. Well, I'm not saying that isn't true. I mean, lying is a very dangerous course to pursue because you can get caught. Even the best liars, let's be you know, the people who have been very skillful, artistic liars, sometimes in the end they have to hold up their hands and say, okay, I've done it, I've done it, okay, I'm out. But generally speaking, it can be more successful than we like to pretend. Lying wins a lot of the time. It gets you somewhere. And so to simply say lying is bad because it has disastrous effects on society, I don't think that accounts for the deep sense that we have that it's still wrong. Because people... I'll give you another example. I mean, this is really recent. Some of you may have even heard of it. These... Um, these two hip-hop artists from Scotland. Uh, I think they're called Gavin Bailey and Billy Boyd. And they, they, they basically tried to break into the hip-hop market by being brilliant rappers, but they didn't get anywhere because they're from Scotland. So it was like, oh, come on, the hip-hop artists don't come from there. So they changed themselves. They said, well, we're actually from California, man. And they, they made themselves into these, these, these guys called um, Brains and Syllable. And this is coming out in a movie, that documentary movie. It's a big deal. It's all over the news at the moment. We've written a book. And, and they got away with it. They were successful. They, they were like, the, they, their agent was touting them as the, 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 the double act Eminem. They were the next huge thing in hip hop. Here they come. These guys are massive. Guys from California. They are from the hood. They are from the ghetto. They know what it's like. And they can, and they're from Bonnie, Scotland. But here's the thing, they, they came to a point where they just broke. I mean, they just could not handle the deception. They just felt terrible. It was like stomach ulcers and insomnia, and they were saying lie after lie. They had to, the whole lives were based on falsehood, and it destroyed them. And eventually they had to come clean, because, not because it was, not because they got caught, because they just knew it was wrong. It's odd, isn't it? I think we actually know lying is wrong even when it works. And that in itself is curious, right? Because if, if what we are is simply the products of chance, matter over time evolves by chance to become evolved apes called human beings. We are just a collection of random atoms and molecules and cells and tissue and organs and suddenly you've got these these beasts called homo sapiens these human beings that are still just machines that's what they are they're random they're just as much machinery as any as a rock or a waterfall as a planetary system there's no soul there's no actual mind it's just an explosion of movements within this matter between our ears that's all it is and yet we've succeeded in the evolutionary process because we lie. Because we're successful, because we eat other species. We're better than other species. That's why we're here, because we won. Congratulations. And yet we know that lying is still wrong, even though it works. That, to me, is difficult to explain. The fact that we know it's wrong because it's wrong because it's wrong. Why do we have that feeling? I'll tell you why I think we have that feeling. The reason why is because we're not just random, mutated bunches of atoms. We're made by a person in his image to reflect him, to be like him, to show the universe what he's like. The Bible says on page one that God made the man and the woman in his likeness to show himself to creation. And so when we lie, what we're saying to the universe is God's a liar. That's what we're saying. That's, that's it. That's the message. I lie because I'm like my maker. My maker must be a liar. Deep down, we know that's wrong. That's where it comes. That's where the guilt comes from, God. That's where it comes it's from this deep, even if we've pushed it down, try to stuff it into the suitcase and zip it up and pretend it's not there. 
this deep prevailing sense that there's something wrong with our deception. There's something wrong with our soul. And in our heart, we know we're living a lie. And it's wrong, wrong, wrong. It's just wrong. And you may not have ever thought of it like this, but that is a clue to the reality of God that He's real and that He actually hates lies. So we've drifted, we've turned away, we've become deceptive. We don't represent him that well anymore. We're like a mirror that someone's taken a hammer to. This perfect image that was reflected of God in us is now a shattered image. It's not a true image. It's all distorted by our rebellion. You go back to places in the Bible that describe the character of God. You get to Numbers chapter 23 where it says this, God is not man that he should lie. Or a son of man, that he should change his mind. Has he said, and will he not do it? Or has he spoken, and will he not fulfill it? Right at the very heart of God's character is truthfulness, faithfulness, purity of speech, honesty. To the point of suffering. You get into the New Testament, you get to verses like Titus chapter 1 verse 2. It says, God cannot lie never lies or or hebrews chapter 6 verse 18 it is impossible for god to lie it's impossible it's not just that he, he he's against it it's just not it's just it's 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 and it's just the opposite it's like heat and cold with god it just doesn't belong they they force each other out like this kind of opposite wind magnets kind of resist you know I don't know how that works I'm some, what some of you are doing physics I haven't a clue well what about Proverbs go, go back to the book of Proverbs you get to Proverbs chapter 12 Proverbs 12 let me read to you it comes up on you anyway lying lips are an abomination to the Lord that's a strong word okay an abomination you're getting the image I'm reading a few verses to you to make the point I'm giving a quick scan of what the Bible says about it because I want you to get a sense of the the reality of God's forceful nature when it comes to honesty truth and lying and we are made in his likeness and that's why profoundly deep down we sense there's something wrong with it lying is not wrong because it ruins society it ruins society because it's wrong We start with God. We must start with God. What's he like? But we still do it. Why do we do it? Why do we do it? That's the thing I want to ask next. And we do do it. Okay, just in case you're wondering, you do do this, okay? I know we're not all Lance Armstrong. I know we're not all Richard Nixon. I know we're not all... Jonathan Aitken, I know we're not all those people that, that famously commit epic perjury. We're not all Bill Clinton. We're not all standing on television speaking to CNN and the world saying, I did not have sexual relations with that woman. Okay, we're not on that famous, world-beating, intercontinental level liars. But we're still liars. And you know that the the Bible doesn't really care how epic. The Bible doesn't care if you do it in court or in the press. The Bible doesn't care how famous your lie is. God doesn't care tuppence about that. What he cares about is what's in your heart. He, He cares about why you do it. And the, the, the answer is actually right here in the same chapter of the Bible. You skip back a few lines, you get to chapter 4, verse uh, 22, which says this, Put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life, which is corrupt through deceitful desires. Simple as that. S- deceitful desires. That's where it comes from. It comes from desire. It comes from the heart. You and I were made by a God who is filled with desires he, he is a, a <laughs> just a glorious cauldron of desire that's who god is he's filled with passion and appetite and love and joy and excitement and he's made us in his image we, we can't but desire things it's how we made you were born desiring you came out of the womb worshiping longing wanting 
craving, passionate. And you were made to be passionate for him. That's what you were born to do. That's why you were designed. That's what you're wired for. That's why we're different to animals. We're different to every other thing in existence. Because you're made with an ability to desire God from a true conscious heart. You want something. But the thing we've done from the beginning is we've yanked ourselves free from him. We've cut ourselves off. We've severed the link. And instead of having a God to, to waste our desires on and feast our hearts on, we now feast our hearts, our longings on anything but God. Give me anything except God. Oh, no, keep away from God. Whatever you do, some of you, you came to church kicking and screaming. Someone dragged you along. And you're like, oh, the last place I want to be in church. That's a clue. There's a reason why we, 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 we don't want God. We don't desire God. Because from the beginning, we've cut ourselves from him. We, we've given him rejection. We've given him rebellion. And the result is that we can't stop desiring things. We can't stop being human. We are. It's just it's not going to change. We just don't know how to be human. Filled with longing. So we're kind of basing our lives on a, on a falsehood, on a, on a lie. And because of that, we find it very easy to carry on lying. We lie because of what we want. If you go back a few pages of the Bible, you get to Romans in chapter 1. I'm giving you a lot of verses. I tend to give a few verses every time I preach because we get this from the Bible, all right? That's what we do. We teach this book because this book is so relevant. It's, it's the real answer to the needs of our lives. In Romans chapter 1, it says, talking about the human race, talking about me and you. Okay, from the very beginning, we've exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshipped and served the creature. Instead of worshipping the creator, we've worshipped what the creator made, namely ourselves and other things that we want. We've spent our desire on all this other stuff, and the Bible calls that a lie. We've exchanged the true God for a lie. We want things that are not God. And if you want things enough, you will do anything to have them, including deceit, <laughs> including dishonesty. Of course you will, because what you want will easily trump any desire you have for telling the truth. Yeah, I love honesty. I love honest people. I love it when people tell the truth. I think it's wonderful when people just speak honestly. Good for them. Speaking up, speaking the truth. That's good. I really love that. But do you love it enough to do it yourself? No, because really what I love is my own personal cause and the importance of me and my greatness and the advance of me in this world and my personal empire, my personal mission in life to be great, to, to, be, to, be, to have my life independent of God, to be free, to just focus on me and my personal desires and needs. And so I lie. Because if I lie, then I, that way I'll, I'll get the promotion that I want. If I lie, I'll get the grade I want. If I lie on my CV, I'll get the job I want. If I lie to these people, I'll get the respect I want. If I lie to this girl, I'll get the sex I want. If I lie to these people, I'll, I'll get the money. I'll get the thing. The thing, the desire will be fulfilled. And if it takes a lie, so be it. Because what I want, what I must have is this. I won't have him. I will not have him. But I'll have this. And I'll lie to get this. The Bible says deceitful desires. We burn with them. We're gripped with them. We're filled with them. Jesus spoke incredibly forcefully about this. You go to the book of John, chapter 8, and Jesus is standing in front of his worst critics. All right, they're all <laughs> they're having this massive criticism fest. Jesus is being uh, uh, significantly, basically beaten on by all of his enemies, and he turns to them in John chapter 8, in verse 44. He says, you are of your father the devil. And your will is to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character. For he is a liar and the father of lies. And Because I tell the truth, you do not believe me. That last line, it ought to shock you. 
Jesus Christ, Jesus of Nazareth, the, the hero of the Bible, the one we all respect, even if we're not, even if we're atheists, even if we're Muslims, we all say, Jesus is a good guy. This good guy says to the human race, because I tell the truth, you don't believe me. He doesn't say, because you disagree with me, you don't believe me. It's because I tell the truth. You don't like truth. What? Oh, Jesus, this morning you said it was a nice sunny day, and you were right, and, and I believed you, and so well, I don't understand what you're talking about. He's not talking about the things on the surface of life. He's talking about the, the seven-eighths of the iceberg under the surface. He's talking about the, the stuff that goes on under the skin, in the heart. He's saying it's a cauldron of lies. He says, because I tell you the truth, you don't like it. You don't want to know because you reject it. Because why? Because from the beginning, you sold your soul to a snake who said to you, God the Father is not to be trusted. He is not good. This thing that God is holding back from you, it is good. God doesn't like you, and so he won't let you have it. Generations have gone by believing the same testimony of the snake. Instead of believing the words of Father God, we'll believe anything else. God the Father who says, I know you. I made you. I know how you tick. I know everything about you. I know how you can be happy. I want you to be happy. Here's the way. Walk in this way. Do this. Don't do that. Do this. This is what will bring you joy in your life, in your family, in your community, in your society. This is the way to walk. Walk, walk towards me. Walk like a father to his kid. This way, this way, this way, this way, this way. What came into the universe was a snake who said, don't walk his way. Go this way. Don't trust him. He's a bad dad. He's got nothing good to give to you. He's holding you down. The reason he says don't take the fruit of this tree is because he's frightened of you. He doesn't want you to be gods like he is. He doesn't want to have competition in the universe. He wants to repress you. He wants to hold you under his heel. And stupidly, from the beginning, that's precisely what we've done. We've taken the fruit. We've taken the things that God said, that's not going to help you. And then we blamed him for the stupid harvest of oppression that we've reaped in our own lives. The disasters that we've brought into our own lives. The stupid stuff that we've done. And we've caused stupid stuff to be done back to us. And then we wag our fingers and say, well, you're, you can't be a very good God. You allowed this to happen in the world. How foolish we are. We're believing our own lie. We're believing the snake's lie. We're, we're building a whole society on deception, on falsehood, on untruth. It's our fault. Friends, listen, at the bottom of our hearts, we have to accept. I know, we, I know some of you are saying, no, 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 you're, you're over the top. That's not why the world's the way it is. That's, this is what Jesus came teaching. I'm telling you what Jesus came teaching. And this is the result. It's a world that is built, it's, built it's, it's, it's decided on a lie. It's agreed with a lie. God is not good. That's the, lie. That's the deepest lie at the bottom of the human heart. He's not good. I don't want to be in church. I don't want to read the Bible. I don't want to pray. I don't want to trust him. I don't want to give money to poor people. I don't want to, I, I don't, I don't, because I don't, he's not good. I'm good. I know better than he does. I'll make my own truth. Well, that's why we lie. That's the profound and real reason. And, that, and that's it. That's, that's human history from that point onwards. We lie because we believe the lie. And every desire, everything we build our lives on. It's like the book of Isaiah, where, where the prophet in the Old Testament, speaking to the people of God, he, he says in Isaiah uh, chapter 44, speaking to them with incredible power, he says to them, is, you won't come to the point of saying, is there not a lie in my right hand? The thing that we believe, the thing we worship, the thing we base our lives on, like the walking stick that we put the, the weight of our lives on. He says, is, is it not a lie? Is it not untrue? Stuff that you've believed about yourself. Stuff you've believed about God from the beginning. Stuff that you've believed about how to live your life. Yeah, you're just ridiculous saying that sex before marriage is, is, is bad. How, how incredibly narrow-minded you are. You have cut yourselves off from the real world. That's narrow-minded. And so we narrow our own minds. We shut our own minds. We close our own eyes away from what God has revealed to us. We won't accept it. Will suppress the truth. And God says, Come back to me. He offers a way. You might say, How? How do we change? How do we get free from lying? It's a good question. It's the right question. How are we going to see any difference? 
The answer is found in the person who came preaching. I tell you the truth. You know, Jesus, in some of the old translations of the Bible, you'll notice it. He, he, he often uses this phrase in the old, well, the old translations put it this way, verily, verily. Every time Jesus speaks, verily, verily. What does that mean, verily, verily? It was just an old word for truly, truly. And in the up-to-date translations, they change it to, I tell you the truth. You imagine God coming down from heaven as a man, born as a baby, growing up in a world poisoned with deception, shocked by the, the incredible difference between truth and falsehood. Which we, we you know, I say, you look at the epic liars, you think, that's not me, that's not me, but friends, what about what we just, just hide behind, the masks on our Facebook pages? What about just the things that might seem so small, but it's just deception? And someone says to you, how are you really doing? Have you done this? Have you ever done, have you done that? I can't tell you the truth. I can't. I can't. What will happen if I tell you the truth? Right through to the apparently mundane stuff. <laughs> Don't tell them I'm in when the phone rings. Don't tell them I'm in. I'm not in. That sounds so innocent, but what's in our heart? I've never had anyone tell the truth and they said to me, can I just have a minute of your time? <laughs> That's never been true, ever. We, 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 just, we, we do this all the time, in, in small ways, apparently small ways and big ways. Jesus comes into a world just dominated by it. No one's actually true. No one is. No one seems to be. And he gets to the point where he's ready to preach, where his public ministry begins. What did he start saying? I tell you the truth. I want to tell you the truth about him, about you, about the world, about the need of the hour, about what must be done. I've come to tell you the truth. I'm so grateful for him. And, and because of him, there's hope. Because the thing that Jesus has done is he's offered us what the liar offers us, but he offers it us honestly. He can deliver what he advertises on. The liar comes into the world saying, do this. Don't trust God. Do this, and you'll find contentment. Jesus comes into the world saying, come to me. All who are weary and burdened, come to me. I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, because I am meek and lowly, and you will find rest for your souls. That's what Jesus said. Jesus says to a world that is suffering under the strain of dishonesty, covered by a burden of constantly having to, to keep up this, this tissue of deception, keep the tangled web going. Because when we lie, we have to tell other lies and other lies and other lies. There are people in this room, people watching this on screens, who, who are living such a lie that you've had to lie about 20 times this week to keep the deception going. You've lied about that, so you had to lie about this lie, and then you had to lie about that lie. You constantly, constantly live in this pressure of how am I ever going to keep this going? It's a horrible way to live. And frankly, that's what the whole human race is doing, because at the bottom of our hearts is this lie that says God can't be trusted. Jesus comes and says, look, come, come to me, come, come, come. Take, take my yoke on you. Take my teaching on you. Follow me. Do you know what you'll find? You think you're going to find pressure. You think you're going to come to Jesus Christ and find it's exhausting. Religion is so tiring. Being a Christian is horrible and oppressive. That's why Christians always look so miserable. Because if you follow him, that's a, that is a first-class ticket to depression and condemnation and discouragement. Jesus never, ever preached that. Jesus said, come to me, all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. I'll give you peace. You'll find rest for your soul. I mean, it's one thing getting rest three weeks on a beach in Greece, but rest for your soul. How long has it been for some of you since you found that? Who can give it? The snake? Society? The media? The celebrity culture? Facebook? Twitter? Instagram? Who can give you rest for your soul? There's one man, I tell you the truth. I'm telling you the truth. Why would you believe it? Why would you rest your weight on a lie? To 
trust me, you'll find rest for your soul. And when you find it, when you find this security of knowing, do you mean my sins are forgiven? Do you mean all the lies are removed? Do you mean that I'm secure with you? Do you mean that when I die, I get to be with you? Do you mean that the worst that could possibly happen to me is just a first-class non-return ticket to be with you at your right hand forever and ever. Do you mean all those things? Do you mean that you're going to be with me even unto the end of the age? Do you mean you're going to give me peace and a sense of your presence at the darkest times of my life when I walk through the valley of the shadow of death? You're going to be with me? Are all these things true? And when you come to know by the power of the Holy Spirit that yes, they are true, do you know what? Lying, oh man, it just loses its edge. Who needs it? Who needs it? Who needs to hide behind a lie when you've got Jesus to hide behind? Why would you? Why would you? Some of you, this is the crucial moment maybe of your life right now. Because up till now, you've been hiding behind falsehood. You've believed a lie about God. You've believed a lie about yourself. Whatever it is, your, your identity, what you're here on the planet for, Maybe your orientation. You've believed stuff that you've, you've oh, this is who I am. Jesus says, come to me. Come, I want to tell you. I want to help you. I want to give you freedom. I want to give you joy. I remember when I was um, just about 17 uh, at college, and I just finished... Uh, a long season of trying to ignore God, trying to keep away from Him, rebelling from Him. And I came back to Him, age 16, 17 sort of time, and I, I had this moment in an A-level uh, lesson where we were doing a test, and I, I basically cheated in the test. I went home thinking, I cheated, that was out of order, I shouldn't have done that. Christians don't do that, it was wrong. And I realized I was going to have to go and tell my teacher and I thought, I'm not going to be able to tell him on his own because there'll be other people always in the lesson sitting around. That there won't be a private moment. Others will have to hear. Does this mean I'm going to have to tell him? Oh, no. Oh, no. I was terrified. I felt like God saying that that doesn't matter. So I went to him and I, I had to go through this process. Of, I'm sorry, I, I, I blew it. I cheated in the test. But I've noticed looking back on the many times in life, I mean, this happens... With my wife, times when I have to tell her the truth about something, and I know that I don't want to. I don't want to tell her the truth. I don't want to tell her the real truth. Why is it? Why do we not want to? So I'll tell you, what, for me, it's because I don't have any control about what happens next. Do you know what I mean? You tell the truth to someone, you don't have a clue what will happen next. You can't predict it. You can't. You, can't, you just don't know. Are they going to go crazy at you? Are they going to not talk to you for days? Are they going to cut you out of the course? Are you going to lose some money? Are you going to lose some respect? Are you going to lose some reputation? Are you going to go to prison? You don't know. You have no control. And the thing we can't stand is when we have no control. Because we want to be God. And the whole point of the Christian life is that we're not. We say, God, I trust you. We fall back into his arms like kids who are falling back into their parents' arms when they play that game, you know? Can I trust you? Some of you, that's just what you need to do today. You need to say, God, I, I trust you. I'll tell the truth. I don't know what's going to come of it. And you don't. I know you don't. I know it's frightening. But that's what we need. We need a church like that. We need a community. We need humanity. That's why... Being human is what this is about. It's about a new humanity, humanity 2.0. It's called the church. It's, it's, a, it's, it's like he says in this very verse. He says in verse 24, sorry, verse 25, speak the truth with his neighbor, each one of you, because we are members of one another. We don't just speak the truth because, well, truth is good and we're robots who love the truth. It's not, a, it's not just that. It's not just that the truth is good. Robots can do that. Computers are very good at telling the truth. They're really annoyingly at the wrong times. An error of 606 has occurred. Thanks. That's not how God made you. You're not a robot, all right? This isn't a sermon where you all get up off your, your backside afterwards and go up to in the church who you've been longing to tell the truth to for quite a while. <laughs> he said about the preacher said we've got to tell the truth, so I just feel I just need to tell you, you're ugly. <laughs> oh, I'm just 
so glad I got off my chest. I do feel free. I feel so much freer now. I just feel so good about it. Thank you, Jesus, for the freedom that you give. No, that's not how it works. You look at it, it says, we're members of one another. That's why he says earlier in the book, speaking the truth in love. These things go together. They always go together. They must go together. When you are learning to do the truth thing and the love thing, you're getting somewhere. Some of us are really good at the truth thing, right? <laughs> Some people in church, they're really good at telling the truth. And us elders in the church, we hate them. Because they're just, they constantly want to take over. It's just constantly, I think the truth, truth, truth. You think, have you ever thought for one moment about the verse that says truth in love, truth in love? Do you know, if people know that you love them, you can tell them the truth. You notice that? If you, if you give and love and serve people, you find there's an openness to hearing the truth. It's the way we're designed. And some of us are the opposite. We're great at the, the love. We're really good at the love, the sweetness, the tenderness, the niceness, even the sickliness, the sentimentality, the sugariness of Christian relationships. And it's all false. It's not real. There's no honesty. No one knows what you really think. No one has known for 10 years because you've just been putting on a church face every Sunday. What we need is a church, not just Christians, but a church of people who know about speaking the truth in love. That's, that's it. That's the sweet spot. You know why it's the sweet spot? Because it's just what Jesus is like. The Bible says he came from the Father full of grace and truth. That's who he is. Because he's like that, we get to reflect him. We need to grow up into that kind of maturity, learning to love people with the things that we say. And some of you, you've never done this because you're, hard, you're terrified of sharing truth. You're terrified of opening up. You're terrified of being real with people. Community has to be real or it's a waste. Who wants to be in a church small group where no one's real? You've got plenty of opportunities to be in places where no one's real. Why have another one? I want to be with brothers and sisters in the church where I get to open up. We get to share. We get to take the mask off and we get to change. And some of you, you, you've got into such a level of falsehood, it's going to take a lot to help you, I suppose. We have things in this church called redemption groups. We're starting them, actually, a whole load of new ones very soon. You may need this. You may need a season of eight weeks where you gather with other people who just want to get closer to Jesus, really go deep with him, really talk to one another, learn together what it means to have your heart changed by the power of Jesus. You get weeks of that kind of help and talk. And people who have gone on this course have just said to us, it's changed my life. This is so helpful. It's changing my life. It's, it's open. It's real. It's brutally real, but beautiful, gracious, helpful. You should get involved. You should find out. You should go to the Connect Point afterwards. Connect with us. Talk with us. We'd love to help you in one of those redemption groups. You need to maybe just join an ordinary small group. You don't have to have the espresso version. You just need to be Americano. You just need to be in a small group. Just normal church where we, not just on a Sunday, but we're in each other's lives in the week. Get into places where you can actually open up and be real with people. Because the Bible says, going back to the book of 1 John, chapter 1, it talks about walking in the light. Walking in the light, we have fellowship with God and with one another. Not just with God, but with one another. That's what walking in the light is like. When I'm lying to you and I'm deceiving you, I'm not walking in the light. I'm in darkness. The church is in darkness. You have whole churches of sheer darkness where no one's been honest with anyone for years. God calls us to something so different. I was thinking about this this week. And I just want to read this to you. A story that I heard years ago, and I just dug it out again. Of a college in, in Asbury, Kentucky in America where some Christians had a chapel meeting in the morning. And they would uh, normally have it every week. And the guy that was doing the talk that day, he decided, I'm not going to do the talk. I'm just going to confess a few things that have been wrong in my life and talk a little bit about how Jesus has changed my life. He just talked from his heart. When he finished, someone else got up and said, do you know what? I think I've got a similar story. Can I share what happened with me as well? And then someone else came up and then someone else. This is in 1970. It's a long time ago. It's a different culture as well, the South in America, it's very different. But listen, the principal of the college 
he was contacted by the guy that was running the meeting because he was away, and they said to him, um, just chapel, uh, just need to know, chapel that started at 8 this morning, was supposed to finish at 9, it was now midnight, uh, it hasn't finished. And what happened was just everybody just stayed. They just started talking, talking, talk, being honest, coming to the platform, sharing their story and praying for each other. And then people from all over the neighborhood, all over the town, it got on the, on the news. It got on the, indi- on the secular news. It's this amazing. People driving in from miles around to come and talk honestly about what's going on. And sharing their stories and getting right with God. And he tells this story, just to, I want to end with this, just as an example. I've got iOS 7, so my phone is misbehaving. Let me read this to you. I suppose I'd been there about an hour. This is what the principal said when he turned up late. It was a couple of days into the movement. A lady came up. She walked back and knelt side of the seat where I was sitting and looked up at me and said, Dr. Kinlaw, may I talk with you? I said, yeah. She said, I need help. I'm a liar. She said, I lie so much, I don't even know when I'm lying. I'm a liar. Now what do I do? Well, I sat there for a moment or two, and I'd never said this to anybody else, but I looked at her and I said, why don't you start back to the last person you remember that you lied to, confess it to that person, and ask him or her to forgive you. Oh, she said, that would kill me. I said, no, it would probably cure you. Three days later, she came to me radiant. and She said, Dr. Kinlaw, I'm free. I said, what do you mean you're free? She said, I just confessed to my 34th person and I'm free. And that was the kind of thing that was taking place. See, Jesus died and rose again to create a new humanity, a new community that lives in the presence of God, which puts aside lying. It doesn't fit. It does what it says right here. Put away falsehood. It doesn't belong. We don't need it. We've got security. We've got peace. We've got everything we need. And Jesus Christ has given it to us. I can be honest with you, I hope. You can be honest with me. We can learn this thing and become this new community that God longs for in the world, even in this city of Brighton.